<laughs> and it's another beautiful day. It's funny because we all have families. We have brothers, sisters, in-laws, outlaws. <laughs> we have those that were the mom loved you best kind or maybe you have some type of daddy's girl or the father and son relationship or maybe a mother or maybe missing fathers or missing mothers. Maybe you were an only child. But in all of these relationships that we have that God has placed us in, there is always a purpose and a design that God has caused us to be finding ourselves, if we're saved, a reason why God put us there. For me, in Scripture, there's a portion that is written that says, and he put the solitary in the family. And for myself, as I read that, I understood that to be a popular expression that my family used about me was that I was considered, because I was the firstborn, the only child in a family of four because I was always off by myself in some way, you know, and there's a lot about why or how, but God used it in his way to say that I was the solitary in the family of four. He sets the solitary in the family. There's always one person who's off by themselves. And that isn't to say that I didn't love my sisters or I didn't care about them or I don't to this day. Because you see, when I got saved, God chose me in the midst of my family to bring salvation to my entire family. That as I saw it in a dream one time, it was like he just took his finger and said, boom, and chose me. Now, I could say I chose God, but I'd be lying because God we're told that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. God chose me for his reason. Now, loving my family and my early days as a Christian, I spent lots of time sharing with them my faith or sharing with them the scripture that I kept driving and pushing on them and, you know, just adamant about how important it was for them to recognize that there was something that they needed to do about their life. That they needed to find God and find Jesus for salvation because I was so pushy about this heaven and hell that they needed to come to an understanding of that. So even though they didn't, <laughs> by way of my own pushiness, come to salvation by my efforts, in some ways God used it anyways and accomplished salvation in them and they've been saved. And same thing with my mother was that... Um, I went way out of my way to have conversation with her and to, in the early days of my life, to, as a Christian, to watch for and to see what they were doing and then to follow up on them, to try to get them to change a little bit in their life. And sometimes it might not have been directly the church, but it might have been indirectly influencing them in some way to turn to God. And each one of them, until the time I felt content, I spent much hours in agony of prayer, in wanting them, in sometimes going to them personally and helping them in their moment of need or helping them at some point in time. And likewise, they, if I was in need, helped me. But I always had in the back of my mind that that was what God designed for me to be at that moment. And then there came a time where God caused me to let go and let them become who they are in Jesus. And for some of them, they went backslidden and some of them have gone their own way and some of them have their own individual relationship that I might not understand. But I do believe <laughs> with all my heart that they're saved. And because I trust in the Lord, I don't feel as though I needed to go and constantly, you know, see them or be with them because I expect to have a relationship with them in heaven that it passes what I have had with them here on earth. I expect to enjoy their friendship and what they've done with Jesus in their life in the Millennium Kingdom to come. And because I have that attitude, I don't feel that filial tie, that want or desire to constantly you know, follow up and see where they're at and what they're doing. And it doesn't mean that I love them any less. 
like Jesus. It just simply means that I love them as they are. Those that do the will of God are my brothers and my sisters. They are my family. And there have been men of God and women of God and children of God that I have felt completely close to because they are faithful to the Lord. And Jesus said that about his family one time when they came to him and they tried to stop him from going to Jerusalem. His brothers and his sisters, and he did have them, and his mother, they came to him and they wanted him to maybe tone it down or not do what he was doing. And he said to one of the people that was there at the time, when they spoke to him, he, they said, Behold, your mother and your brethren are here. And he says, Who is my mother and my brethren? But they that do the will of God. So it's not that you love your family any less if they're saved or if they're not saved, but that you love God more. So don't be dismayed if you don't have the time sometimes because God is using you in a different direction to not be so consumed by your family relationships as you are obsessed or possessed by the will of God doing in you to accomplish something for someone else because sometimes you have to set aside your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your house, your home, your family, and your very life in order for God to take it up and to give back to you what is your house, your home, your family, your mother, your brother, your sister. And when he does, then he allows you in those moments to have a complete enjoyment of the time together. So I do love my, my sisters, <laughs> though I rarely see them anymore. And I love my mother, though she died and I was far away. And I do love my filial family, meaning their grandchildren and, I mean, not my grandchildren, I don't have any children, but my family that comes through my sisters by way of their children's children and their nieces and nephews. And then also my wife, who has children before she married me. I pray for them because they're not saved and I look forward to the time that I will speak clearly and plainly to them because... God gave me a portion of time to let my wife be a witness to them, to pray for them, to care about them. But the day will come, which I have already set aside unto the Lord for this ministry, that starting in 2013, that I don't believe the Lord will return before 2012, and that in a very real and outward way, share with them the reality of heaven and hell, and to simply say, you know, God loves you, but God isn't going to, you know, patronize you anymore or to give you this quote-unquote purpose-driven, wonderful life thing, but that it is the end of the world. And Jesus is coming soon, and you need to deal with the reality of it. And you may never speak to me again, <laughs> but this is what the gospel is, a personal relationship with God. And so I do love my families, all of them. And I wanted to take the time to say that, and to express to them that though I'm not there at times, oh, they're in my mind, but they're more so in the heart of God because he loved them so much that he gave his son for them and that he can do a better job of loving them and being with them than I ever could. In Streams in the Desert today, when he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was, John 11:6. In the forefront of this marvelous chapter stands the affirmation, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, as if to teach us that at the very heart and foundation of all God's dealings with us, however dark and mysterious they may be, we must dare to believe in and assert the infinite, unmerited, and unchanging love of God. Love permits pain. The sisters never doubted that he would speed at all hazards and stay their brother from death, but... When he had heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days more still in the same place where he was. What a startling, therefore. He abstained from going, not because he did not love them, but because he did love them. His love alone kept him back from hastening at once to the dear and stricken home. Anything less than infinite love would have rushed instantly to the relief of those loved and troubled hearts. To stay their grief and to have the luxury of wiping away their tears and staunching their sorrow and sighings to cause them to flee away by his very presence. Divine love could hold divine love alone could hold back the impetuousness 
of the Savior's tenderheartedness until the angel of pain had done her work. Who can estimate how much we owe to suffering and pain? But for them, we should have little scope for many of the chief virtues of the Christian life. Where were faith without trial to test it, or patience with nothing to bear, or experience without tribulation to develop it? In other words, just because God doesn't seem that he's there, he cares. And just because God tarries or waits doesn't mean that he doesn't love. The reality is he loves more. And there is a purpose for why God might not be there at the moment you think he is, but he is always there in the moment that we shall see he is always available to us because he lives in us. And so because God is in me and in my sisters, I know that the best that I could give to them, whether present or absent, is the Jesus that I knew and the Jesus I know is living in them. And because of that, I love them even more so.